going to share our devotional this morning. Last Sunday, Sister Barbara Schneider sent a little text over and she said in between her classes um, on Sunday that she teaches um, children online, and the Lord just prompted her to send us this song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And she wrote a little note with it, and she sent the words, and then she sent also the song being, you know, played audio. And so as I have thought about that and, and, you know, just reflected on those words to that hymn this week, I thought surely there's a story behind the song because the verses are so powerful. And there was. And that's what I'm going to share for a devotional this morning. Stand Up for, Stand Up for Jesus was a hymn that was inspired by this dying man um, and his message. His name was Dudley Tang. And he was a minister, a young preacher in Philadelphia, and he was forced to resign his pastorate. Now, this was in the 1800s uh, from the church pastorate for speaking out against slavery in the mid-1800s. Well, in addition to starting a new church, Ting, Tying, I really think is the way we pronounce this, Tying, and other ministers preached revival meetings at the local YMCA during lunch and soon began to attract thousands. And this revival period is known as the work of God in Philadelphia. I liked that. It was the work of God in Philadelphia. And in March of 1858, Tying preached a rousing sermon to get this 5,000 young men that had come to the YMCA that day. And over a 1,000 of those men made a profession of faith. Only a few days later, Tying left the study of his home, um, a country home, to visit his barn where a mule was harnessed to a machine that was shelling corn. And when he patted the mule, his sleeve was caught in the cogs of the wheel and his arm was badly maimed. He passed away the following week from the injury. But before he died, he was asked if he had a message for the ministers at the revival. And he replied, tell them, let us all stand up for Jesus. So his friend and fellow preacher, Dr. George Duffield, was touched by the words and he wrote the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Duffield concluded his sermon the following Sunday by reading the lyrics as a tribute to his friend. And Duffield's Sunday school superintendent printed copies of them and the lyrics soon found their way into a Baptist newspaper and the hymn spread from there. And somewhere along the way, a gentleman named G.J. Webb put the music to the hymn, and it found its way into hymn books. And I wondered yesterday, I wonder, I think it is, but I just wonder if it's in our traditional Church of God, you know, the red back hymnal. And it was there, page 381. <laughs> So stand up, stand up for Jesus. We're going to sing that just in a little bit. We're going to use three verses. I think the poem had about five verses. But that's the story behind the song, Stand Up for Jesus. Pastor, would you pray for us? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory on to victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. 
Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in His strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls for danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the bitter song. To those who vanquish evil, a crown of life shall be. Be with the King of glory, shall reign eternally. To those who overcome, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. We've come this far by faith. Leading on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed us yet. Whoa, 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 whoa. We can't turn back now. We've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith, leading on the Lord, trusting in His holy word. He's never failed us yet. Whoa, 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 whoa. we can't turn back now. We've come this far by faith. Oh, 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 we can't turn back now. We've come this far by faith. Amen. Well, we and Sister Molly is going to lead us in a very important prayer right now. I wrote, I wrote the names down so I wouldn't make up names. I'm not political. I'll just be honest with you. I just don't care. I, don't, I think it's so ridiculous. Politics are so ridiculous. But I do care about the nations. And this week we have had three events, one right on top of the other, of nations. And I thought, well, I had this heart to pray for them. And I'm sitting there listening to these songs. And the Lord said, y'all are so selfish. And that kind of startled me. We're trying not to be. He said, you have been so focused on your own nation. Did you have forgotten to lift your eyes to the, to the fields that are white for harvest? You have forgotten there's a whole world going through the same thing you're going through. And the devil, you have allowed him to distract you with your own nation's problems to the point that you're not even praying for other nations anymore. And that... You know, when the Lord speaks to you like that, it's like a tear. That sword of the Spirit will rip you up. But he will heal you because he says, change your, change your ways. These are only four of the nations that are going through trauma besides ours. We're not talking about ours today. I know most of you probably know this, but we're going to pray deliberately for these countries. The United Kingdom has no prime minister. He just resigned under duress. Well, 10 of his cabinet members resigned too. 
So there was not enough people even to elect people to take their place. So you can just see the enemy's plan. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the ex-prime minister of Japan, who was fixing to give a speech, was assassinated in the street. Japan's a pretty good big nation, too. And then Sri Lanka, the president and the prime minister resigned. They stormed the, the, the house that they live in, people, in protest because they don't have enough food. And I'm going to try to pronounce their names. The prime minister is Ranil Rikrameshha. I'm probably ruining that one. The president is Gotaba Rajapska. They're stepping down as soon as there is replacements, and they beg the people, please don't riot. Please, we'll step down. Israel has no prime minister. We have people all over the world. Now, these are not little. Now, Sri Lanka's got some control powers in their area. They have a lot of people under them. You know, we, at the, on Fridays, we had, at one time, we were praying for the world, and we started with Africa, and we prayed for every country in Africa. And honestly, before, we had to take a rest. By the time we, because we would read a little bit of their history, we would read what was going on, what's the national religion, what's happening to the people, and we would weep. Because it's not a good thing. Horrible things are happening all over the world. We think we have problems did you have a bed to sleep in last night? Did you have food on your table? Were you able to drive to church today? We don't have problems. Starvation is one of the biggest problems in Africa. Sri Lanka has all kind of issues. Obviously, this was food. United Kingdom has a lot of problems. And I'm not going to go into what Boris Johnson did. But there's a lot of stuff that Boris Johnson did that's apparently they didn't like. I don't really follow a lot of his business. We've been concentrating on our country. But today the Lord says, lift your eyes. Quit focusing on yourself and start praying for the whole world. We're all in this together. The devil, you can just picture, you can see the plans of the devil revealed right there. Let's get them all loose, take all the leaders out then we can just step in and put who we want in there because they're so desperate. You can see that the Antichrist is waiting in the background. I'll rescue you. That's his voice. I'll bring you peace. So let's take out all the leadership so that when I stand up and say, I'll give you peace, people will be so desperate, they'll say, okay. I don't know if you ever studied much about how Hitler came into power. It wasn't World War II. It was World War I. Post-World War I, he became the rescuer. He started camps out in the, the forest or somewhere and promised the people that all of the young men would get jobs. And what he did not tell them was he was creating an army. So that by the time World War II came, he had a massive army. That's how the devil does he promises things he cannot fulfill. But there is one who can. And that's who I see victory. I see the Lord saying, yeah, he's got his plans. And what he's doing is showing his hand to y'all. So now you know the truth of how to pray. Because greater is where? He who's in us, in the body of Christ, than he who's trying to control the world. So all of these are symptoms of the greatest harvest there's ever been. It's a setup. The devil thinks it's for his parade, but it isn't. It's for God's. The Father is fixing to release. In fact, already has been releasing some of the greatest power and anointing and revelation, wisdom. Get your catchers out. Because if we are the body of Christ, we are the ones who will be receiving the revelation, the knowledge, the wisdom, like Cindy had a revelation this morning. It dropped on her. It's going to be just like that. It may come in dreams. You may be eating your cereal, your Wheaties, or whatever you eat in the morning, your Cocoa Puffs, and suddenly the Lord will talk talking to you. 
You may be brushing your teeth and the Lord will start telling you stuff. Get ready, get ready, because he's already doing it, but he wants to do it more. We are the answer. Not us because of us, but because we contain the very heart of God through Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we just, you hear this, and you already know the answer. You are the answer, Jesus. So we stand in agreement together as the body of Christ. You said we're two or three are gathered. There's more than three. And we agree in the name of Jesus that you are stepping into these situations in every nation. We lift our eyes to the hills, and we see that the harvest is great. And, Lord, we thank you that soon and very soon the greatest harvest we have ever seen will flow and flow and flow. There'll never be buildings big enough to hold the souls coming in. And we just thank you for meeting the needs of these nations, that it will be a quick turnaround. There will be quick leadership. And, God, it will be leadership caused by you. We rebuke all the demonic forces that will try to take over these nations. And we ask, Father God, that holy men, holy women will stand in place, have the boldness and courage to stand up, take their place, and be a part of the leading of that nation. And we give you great thanks and great honor and great glory because we're going to see you move like you have never moved in our eyesight before. We just thank you and praise you. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing in your eyes because you are being released. You're fulfilling the promises you made in the Old, Co the Old Testament. We're seeing it before our eyes, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Far 
be it for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me hallelujah will be thrown into thank you father the midst of the amen sea. amen through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well with me So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves of wind still know His name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves of wind still know His name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. The waves and wind still know His name. It is well. Through it all, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is.
The Lord is reminding me that through it all, A-L-L, every one of us have a different all. What you're through it all may be very different than my through it all. And every one of us, if there's 20, 25, however many of us are in this place today, every one of us have a different all that he's bringing us through. And that through it all, whatever our all is, our eyes are on you. We're trusting you in the midst of the all. Sometimes our all feels like we can't stand up under it. That it's just too heavy. But he reminds us that he's the load lifter. He's the load lifter, and yes, Molly, the way maker. Through it all, ready? Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. to break the bread of life to us. Mm -hmm. Brother Clifton, could you just put up that Jesus is the center 
of our lives. Ready? Jesus is the center of my life. In him I live and move and have my being. I'm alive forever. I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. Jesus knew me while I was in my mother's womb. Therefore, I will strive to achieve his purpose every day of my life. My life nor my family will fall apart because Jesus holds us together. Jesus is the center of my life. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I've been bought with the price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, tell them I am redeemed. If anybody asks if anybody asks you just who I am, tell them I am redeemed. And Father, hallelujah. And Lord, we just today ask and believe that your fresh fire anointing mm -hmm. is continuing to come upon every part of this service yes. and upon our pastor as he breaks the bread of life yes, today. Jesus. And we're still calling forth that cartilage from heaven that has his mm -hmm. name on it to come between on this right side of this hip, between these two bones that are yes, bone on Lord. bone, and come and be placed in between. We're believing for that divine miracle today. We believe that cartilage is there and it has Dennis Langford's name on it. Yes. And we believe yes, it's Lord. coming yes, by faith. We've come this far by faith and we're going to keep moving forward mm. by faith. So may the word mm, penetrate us yes. today. Yes, Father. Oh, that we will mm, mm, go forth this place, from this place in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Amen. Father. Amen. 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 Sharon, I need you to stay right here just a minute, please. I, I got to share something with you, and I'll send this with her because it'll probably ring or buzz and distract me if I don't. But I, I just kept feeling like for the last 10 or 15 minutes that I needed to share something with you that I wrote yesterday. And, and I know it's from God because it blessed me, but he, here it is. Life is a journey. There are many detours, turnarounds, and stop signs along the way. And the only sure way to get through it all is by trusting the Creator. He promised never to leave us, but go with us all the way to the end. We need to go through it so we can get to it. Don't let life's struggles and challenges cheat you out of your divine destiny. Amen. I'll post that. No, I won't, but Sharon will post it on my Facebook page. And if you want it, you can get it from there. If we're Facebook friends, and if we're not, ask me for it and I'll send it to you. I, no, probably Sharon will. <laughs> it is so good to have Sharon in my life. And <laughs> in response to what she just said about this hip, I promise you, if it happens in this service, I'm going to stand up and I'm probably going to walk real fast 
might even run all the way around out there so you'll know something happened. <laughs> I, I want to talk today on uh, a subject that is probably on all of our minds, minds, maybe not in this frame of thought, but I, I'm framing what I want to say with this thought, the, the kingdom of God and the culture war. The kingdom of God and the culture war. Because there is a war going on in our nation spiritually. It's happening day by day. We see, we see the blow come from one side and the blow come from the other side. and uh, it, it all sounds and seems, why are we doing this? There's an evil power behind one side. And as a church, we have to understand that. It's hard to think that people in important places of leadership in a nation would allow themselves to deviate from the, the track and the, the system that has been in place for so long and worked so well. And yet we see that happening in America. The world in America and the world in general is at war with the church. Just accept that. And the church must take up the battle with the world. God didn't call us to be neutral. He didn't call us to wish it would all go away. He called us to get in the fight. He called us to stand up for Him. It's, it's not the people so much that's out there in the world, but the enemy of the church, Satan. He's behind all of this. He's at work through people in the world to negate and render the church ineffective in our mission through the culture of permissiveness that surrounds us. The scriptures tell us we have weapons. And the weapons we have are not fleshly or carnal, but mighty through God, which enables us to pull down strongholds. I'm not talking about a democratic stronghold. I'm not talking about a Republican stronghold. I'm talking about a stronghold of the devil himself that he's trying to hide behind. The Apostle John wrote a very specific message to the church about how to keep the upper hand in this battle. It's recorded in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Are you ready? He said, Do not love the world are the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. I remember a story years ago that uh, a wife saying to her husband, you, you, don't, you don't love me anymore. You never tell me that you love me anymore. And she complained a long time about it. And, and finally, he said to her, I told you I loved you one time. If that's not enough, well, I don't know what else to do. This thing about love should be a vocal thing. We should love God because... He speaks to us all the time through His Word and tells us how much He loves us. I want to read that passage to you that I just read from 1 John in the, in the Scripture uh, from the, the Amplified Version. It says this, Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and His precepts, nor the things that are in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. The world is passing away, and with it its lusts, the shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries out his purposes lives forever. I like the amplification that gives to what I'm looking at there. Right out of the gate this morning, I need to tell you that Satan has done a number on many Christians and churches. He's telling them lies and baiting them to believe them. There is a very liberal, progressive voice that speaks into modern Christianity and Christians. It speaks lies that are contradicted in the Scriptures. Progressive Christianity, which is alive and increasing as we move closer to the second coming of Christ, interprets the Bible through the lens of culture. It does not critique culture through the lens of the Bible. It it, it wants to be inclusive, and, and I want to be inclusive. I want to include everyone. But there is a filter called the Word of God that we have to pass our faith through for us to be included in the real church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just anything goes. It's what's in this book that matters. I'd be get back to the sermon here. It'll get longer and longer if I don't. The aim of progressive Christianity is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. And, And I don't dislike that. But what I understand is when you judge people as being worthy of something, that their life does not spell that out, their testimony does not show that. When you do that, and you invite them in, Jesus said, and and still says, come as you are, but you will leave with a different sense of purpose and mind if you make contact with God. I truly believe that. The Bible says, Jesus speaking... You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8 and 32. We can no more adapt our message to attract people than a physician can change his medicine to accommodate his patient. This is the only medicine we've got that works for eternal salvation right here. There's nothing else. The truth is in the pages of Scripture, which is not up for personal interpretation. Simon Peter wrote about that in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This Bible is not God's gift to us to dissect and decide for ourselves about how to apply it. It's fairly plain. When it says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's easy to understand. You can't let yourself be divided with other things that would take you away from loving Him. I know you're thinking, Pastor, this is getting deeper and deeper. How are you going to get yourself out of all this? We cannot toss out what we don't like and keep what suits our fancy. 
Neither can we twist their meaning to suit our own agenda. And just so you know, the door was left open by the Lord Jesus Christ for all to walk through, but there is only one door, and that door is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. There's no other way. In Luke 13, one of the disciples had asked Jesus a question, and Jesus replied to him. Verse 22, and this is kind of the heart of what's brought me to all of the things that I'm saying today. Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. It was his mission to be in Jerusalem at this time. There was a cross waiting for him there. And he was ready and willing to face that cross. In verse 23, someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? It was apparently preying on the mind of that person to ask based on the teaching Jesus was sharing. Is it just going to be a few that are saved? And Jesus replied, work hard. Say that with me. Work hard. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. You know what's happening today? Progressive Christianity is trying to expand that narrow door. I know the Bible says, whosoever will let him call on the name of the Lord to be saved. But the door getting in there is still narrow. It does still say, work hard. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you working hard on your salvation? <laughs> Verse 25 says, when the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us, but he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. As I said, Jesus was finishing his mission. His mission was to go to Jerusalem and hang on a cross and die for the sins of the people. He could not be distracted from that. It had to be, praise God, he did it for you and for me. The question asked, Lord, will only a few be saved? had to have been generated from the teaching Jesus was giving. And when he literally said, enter the narrow door, you get the picture. You get the picture. The answer to the question is this. The same grace for salvation that you received is available to all who believe and the same teaching that brought you to a saving knowledge of the kingdom of God is available to all who will pursue it. But, there's always a but. Salvation is not as easy as falling off a log. It has to be worked out in the choices and decisions we make in life. Work hard to enter the narrow door. Pastor, you're making it so difficult. No, I'm not. Life makes it difficult. Jesus makes it easy because he reduces the choices to the ones that he knows are going, is going to work. Work hard to enter the narrow door. And I, I would just conclude that thought with this. Anything worth having is worth working and even fighting for. Being saved is easy. But living out your salvation, which is necessary, might not be so easy. There is a war going on, a culture war, with the kingdom of God that you and I are part of. In the name of love and inclusiveness, the liberal progressive church has surrendered 
to the moral revolution. The door of salvation is the same as it has always been. Narrow, but leading us into eternal life when it is walked through. But a worldview has developed based on human desire and not clear revelation from God about this. This is what Paul warned young Timothy against in these words. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth. That is a prophetic statement to a young pastor that is coming true in our world, which was quite young at the time it was given, but 2,000 years later it's coming true. It is happening. Progressive Christians sell their point of view using words like equality and justice. It all sounds biblical. It sounds so good. But when you look past the words, what you find in their agenda is sin. Social justice, they say, includes marriage justice, which means to them same-sex marriage. You don't believe that. Neither do I. And if you do, I need to talk to you after church. Maybe I need to pray for you before you leave today. Tempting to go a little deeper into that, but I'll, I'll just leave it right there. It, it also means to them economic justice, which is spelled socialism in their agenda. It means racial justice or critical race theory, as they call it today, which actually divides the races rather than unifying them as the gospel demands. Behind the term social justice is an entire worldview that is contrary to biblical teaching. Don't be fooled by it. It's not my goal to create an us and them mentality. I didn't even want to preach this today. And I struggled with it the first time I thought about it and read it. But when it came to me, I believe by the hand of God, I knew the decision was already made and I didn't have another choice. What I hope to accomplish today is to draw a line in the sand and challenge us to stay on the right side of it. The message is clear about these times we are living in, in 2 Timothy 3. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from them you have learned them. Knowing from whom you have learned them. I knew that didn't sound right. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 15 in the New King James Version. So what can we do? How are we going to combat this? This is a cultural war we find ourselves in. Here's a list of four things that I wrote down, and there's probably a whole lot more, but I just want to quickly give you these. One is pray. 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 Did I say pray? I'm going to say it again. Pray. Pray. Pray for discernment from God, from the Holy Spirit, about what you see and hear. Ask yourself, do I believe this? Because it sounds compassionate, but it seems actually wrong because it doesn't sound biblical. The most compassionate thing we can do is tell people the truth. John 8, 32 still says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The second thing, ask questions. What are the world's definitions of justice and equality? Are they derived from divine law, the scripture? In Judges 21 and verse 25, the Bible says, Everyone did 
what was right in his own eyes. There seems to be a lot of that going on in our world today. The third thing is Proverbs 23, 23 tells us what it is. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. How do you buy it? How do you pay for it? How many times have you read the Bible through? How often do you read it? This is the truth. This is the truth. You can't, you can't afford to lay it on the shelf and let it get covered with dust. Now, I know it's in your phone, it's in your iPhone. I, I read it in my iPhone a lot. I let it speak to me what it says through the reader reading it, and I read it myself with my eyes because this old head just don't get it sometimes unless I work harder at it. Just pick up the Bible and read it. Buy the truth by paying that price of making yourself read it. You say, Pastor, how many times have you read it through? I try to make it a goal to read it through at least once every year. Every year. I don't know how long I've been doing that, so I don't know how long I've read it through. And it doesn't matter. What matters is that we read this book. It is our manual for life. It is our manual to know how to live in a world that is at war with us. It was before culture ever started. And it's as it is today, and it still is. The fourth thing that I want to tell you is enter through the narrow door. Enter through the narrow door. Shut everything else out. Focus on the narrow door. Stay with it. Because that's the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way. It says closing, and I'm going to try to do that, okay? The one thing to get right is this. Jesus is Lord. So we have to make Him Lord in our lives by surrendering to Him. You can fight. You can fight, but you won't win. You won't win. You've got to get that right. We can't help being in the world. Now, some people live with an escapism mentality. We can't help being in the world. Our parents made that choice for us, and you can't blame them either. It was love that brought you into the world. It was love that raised you up, and it's love that will keep you moving forward. It becomes a matter of our personal choice to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Make Him your Lord and Savior. Again, there's a war going on in the world today. And it's not one you read about in the headlines of the newspapers, but you can see its effect on the lives of people. The devil has never done anything good for you or me. But Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins and give us eternal life beyond this life. Jesus spoke this to us. To me, it's the golden text of the New Testament. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is unconditional love. Love by God's choice. It was God's choice to love you, to love me, even though we were living in sin. It is love by an act of God's own will and desire that you and I be saved. 
I've trusted Him. Probably most everyone in this room have trusted Him. And what is important for us is that we keep on trusting Him. Saying yes to Him. Yes. And, and there are days when I do this too. I ask Jesus, Lord, I feel like my heart's empty today. Please come back into it. I feel like the struggle is taking out of me the things that I need to overcome. Please come back into my heart. You say, Pastor, do you mean you feel like you backslid? Yeah, I do sometimes. Well, what happened? Most of the time I don't even know. But sometimes I do know because I let my temper get the best of me. I let somebody irritate me. I thought or did something I probably shouldn't have thought or done. Better to think it and repent than do it and have to repent. None of this is in my notes. It's from my heart to you to tell you God is always there. Even when you're having the worst temper tantrum you've ever had in your life, He's there. Even when you, you and, I, and I've said this a time or two recently, and some of you, especially one over here on the front row, rebukes me. But sometimes I get murder in my heart because of what I see happening in our country. And I have to repent. Pastor, I would never do that. Well, you don't have to be like me. But God is always there. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. No matter what we go through, He's always there. He's there in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you. He cares. I want you to stand, and I'm going to stand myself because I've got something to lean on here. But I want you to stand. And I want to ask all of you who will to come and just stand right here at the front. Just come on down and stand right here. Just everyone who will, just come stand right down front. Kind of like a sense of family joining together. We're God's family. We belong to Him. You know, we all, we all have different things happening in our lives and going on, but God's grace is sufficient. He'll carry us through. He'll carry us through. If you don't mind, would you just, I see some of you doing it, just join hands. We're, we're family here. We're family here. Just join hands. Father, we're your family today. We're your family at Covenant Life. We love you. Lord, there's not a one of us who doesn't struggle in some way with something. But help us to be overcomers. Help us, Lord, to achieve the purpose that you have for us today. Lord, I know that purpose is to be alive, a shining light everywhere we go. To let our light shine for you out there in the world where sin is claiming lives day after day where sin is wreaking havoc and destroying people. Lord, in Jesus' name, help us to be a light to them. A light of love, a light of purpose, a light of strength. May, be, may Lord, may we be watchers on the wall, looking, looking, seeing, and beginning to engage in prayer for the people that you put before us, beginning to reach to them, Father, 
through the arms of prayer and taking opportunity when it is afforded to personally come alongside that person and be an influence, a kingdom influence upon their lives. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking and confessing that this week, this week, some of us, maybe all of us, are going to have that opportunity to present the dynamic life to someone who needs something to happen in them. Help us, Lord, to walk through that opportunity door. Help us to walk through that door. Give us courage. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, Father, I bless all of these who are in this building today to take advantage of the opportunity that I've just asked you, Father, to give them and to give to me. In the name of Jesus, in the name of, help us, Lord, to stand up for Jesus, to stand up for Jesus. And let us come back with rejoicing as we assemble again in this house, bringing our sheaves with us. In the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. I'm so glad you are here today. I'm, I'm more glad to be here than you could possibly know. I'm also glad that Brian and Rhonda, who are colleagues in the ministry, with us are here today. I appreciate them. Um, we we met together a lot of times and and um, hassled out things and told people they were wrong, told them they were right, <laughs> prayed for one another. Brian and I are still part of a pastoral covenant group that hasn't met in a while, but we're going to get back to it, bud. Um, but I'm going to ask him if he will to dismiss us in prayer and bless us as we go. Brian, would you do that for us? Heavenly Father, we just, we just gather together one more time and we just say we love you. Yes. And are grateful for your grace and your mercy. Yes, Lord. Your outstretched hand, your guidance, your, your unwillingness to turn your back on us. Yes, yes, Lord. To walk with us and talk with us each and every day as you have this morning. Your pastor, we're grateful for the word that you sent to us. Grateful for worship. Grateful for uh, the unity of the body of Christ. Yes. That's where true unity can only be found mm. in the body of Christ. And we're thankful for that. Thankful for your sacrifice and so Lord we just um, today I think I can speak for us all I hope I can when I say to you one more time that, mm. that we receive that sacrifice today yes yes and Lord instead of yes, pronouncing a blessing Lord I just feel in my spirit just to say to you uh, we just all receive that blessing right yes away. yes Yes, Father. The blessing that can only come from your Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Receive that in Jesus' name. Yes. May your mercy and grace saturate us all. Yes, yes Jesus. In this place and enter the world. Not to be of the world, but to be in it. And as we're in it, God, we just would ask that you help us to be a shining light this week that would draw others into the safe harbor uh, of your hands and your heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Fellowship, and I hope that you leave happy. And if you don't have your happy, I hope you find it soon. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.